Following the two demolition jobs suffered at the hands of Galata, Bo announced he was enlisting in the Marine Corps to refine his discipline and dedication. He did three days of heavy training before quitting and announced permanent retirement from boxing shortly after. Following his return to civilian life, Bo's life would regress into domestic issues, seeing one incident where he kidnapped his wife and children. He would serve jail time for this, have more domestic issues with his new wife, and make a return to the sport in 2004 before hanging up the gloves for good in 2008. Or at least so we thought. As of my writing this in September of 2021, Bo is scheduled for an exhibition against Lamar Odom. I'd say best of luck, champ, but as of this re-recording in May of 2023, it never came to be. One more word on the lost Lennox Lewis super fight. Believe it or not, there are minor talks of Bo Lewis happening now, many years after its expiration date. Whatever the future holds, I can only hope and pray for the best for both gentlemen and that they can square away the bad blood they've had. Well, dreams do come true. As of Monday, January 3rd of 2021, Riddick Bowe and Lennox Lewis appear to have squared away their bad blood that dates back to the 1988 Olympics. It's never worth the stress and burden on your body, heart, and soul to hold a grudge. Forgiving does more for yourself than it does for others, everyone. WBO champion Henry Akinwande returned to the ring for the 1997 opener in a unanimous decision defense over Scott Welch. Other than some shady play, the fight was nothing special. Akinwande won just about every round. 21 days later, he vacated the WBO title to fight Lennox Lewis for the WBC title. Yet another testament to how insignificant the WBO was in the scope of the sanctioning bodies. The rematch between Lennox Lewis and Oliver McCall. The WBC title was again on the line, but in vacancy this time. Emmanuel Stewart was in Lewis's corner this time, and Lennox appeared to be in top form for his rematch with his former conqueror. Lewis was patient in his approach to McCall and was getting the better of him. McCall began to act strangely between the third and fourth, refusing to return to his corner. McCall produced limited offense throughout the bout. Lewis attempted to provoke McCall into fighting back, but to no avail. Lewis was landing some big punches on McCall who was falling into a nervous breakdown. He began to cry between the fourth and fifth and was asked if he wanted to continue. He said yes, entered the fifth, and continued the bizarre behavior as Lewis wailed away. Mills Lane stopped the fight and Lennox Lewis was now a two-time heavyweight world champion. Good Lord, another one. It's a bargain sale. In the aftermath, McCall explained that he was attempting to rope-a-dope Lewis with his refusal to engage, and that his breakdown was him trying to get himself in an emotional state. Perhaps drugs and rehab were somewhere in the mix as well. He was suspended and his purse withheld. He would return to boxing in November. IBF champion Michael Moore returned four months later in an otherwise boring defense over Von Bean. There was some commotion over Teddy Atlas saying Moore's son was on the phone and embarrassed of his dad or whatever. 
Mora didn't believe it himself. Butch Lewis's wrestling style promo after the bout may have been more entertaining than the bout itself. Lewis alluded to officials being swayed by the media in regards to his reputation. Oh, and Double M's reputation too. Butch Lewis has never, ever bought a fighter to the ring that wasn't qualified to win. Does it look like he was supposed to be here? Yes, because we won. That, that's all, all I asked them to do was bring in neutral officials who wouldn't be biased by the local media. David Tua blasted the big O out in the 11th round after being outboxed for the majority of the fight. Tua's power was proving more and more to be a game changer as he continued his ascending the ranks. In a tough fight, George Foreman retained the lineage over Lou Savarese. The challenger started strong by taking the first half of the fight but Foreman evened the fight up in the latter half, especially with his win of the final round. Savarese lost a point in the 11th for a low blow. George got the win by split decision, which was fair enough, but what puzzled onlookers was how George won on one card by such a wide margin of 118 to 110. Nonetheless, it was a good showing for both men. As promised and alluded to earlier, here we are, the War of the Gargantuas. The Tuominator and the President engaged in perhaps the most underrated match of the 90s, setting a new CompuBox record for punches thrown in a non-stop head-to-head -head slugfest. Ibeabuchi set the record for total punches thrown by a heavyweight. Ike outlanded Tua and was awarded the unanimous decision victory, ending the undefeated streak of Tua. After the fight, Ike complained of headaches, but nothing abnormal was found. He chalked it up to demons and evil spirits. Tua would undergo elbow surgery to remove bone chips. The vacant WBO title was to be decided between former WBO champion Herbie Hyde and the measuring stick former IBF champion Tony Tucker. The Dancing Destroyer neutralized Tucker's TNT in the second round via three knockdown technical knockout. Herbie Hyde was now a two-time WBO champion, another two-time champion. June 28th was an exciting day for the division. Just wait till you see what's up next. The Sound and the Fury. Wait, no, not that one. That was 25 years earlier. It was finally time for Mike Tyson and Evander Holyfield to get it on again. Tyson appeared to be taking this fight very seriously and portrayed himself as such in the buildup. Holyfield, again, came in more ready than ever for Tyson. Surely, this was to surpass the first fight. Well... If it didn't surpass it action-wise, it sure did spectacle-wise. The fight was proving to rhyme with the first as Holyfield once again overcame Tyson's intimidation and swarming. Tyson looked better in this affair and was picking his spots better, still to no avail against Evander. In the second, Tyson was cut by a clash of the heads after Holyfield ducked under a lunging right from Tyson. Tyson wanted Holyfield to be punished for the butt, but Mills Lane refused after reviewing the footage. The real deal dominated the first two rounds. The third round saw Tyson unleash a vicious combination on Holyfield, but he was unable to deter the champion. Frustrated that the first fight's fate appeared to be on the horizon, Tyson bit Holyfield's ear in the clinch. First, he had a 
Holyfield jumped in pain, signaling Lane to look at his now bleeding ear. Tyson asserted that the damage came from a punch to which Lane called his bluff. Tyson was deducted two points by Lane after almost being disqualified. When the action resumed, Holyfield and Tyson were fired up and the crowd was buzzing. In the clinch, again, Tyson bit Holyfield's other ear. There was no halt to the action this time as the two fought to the bell. When the bite was discovered, Tyson was disqualified between rounds. After the disqualification, Tyson went berserk, desperate to continue fighting Holyfield. Truth be told, everyone, including yours truly, wanted to see more, and it's too bad this fight had to end the way it did. Tyson also got into it with some fans who threw a water bottle at him. In an interview right after, Holyfield said that he already forgave Tyson because of his undying faith in Jesus Christ. The Nevada State Athletic Commission fined Tyson $3 million and revoked his boxing license. This began a dark streak for the once glorious champion. Kid Dynamite was losing control. This was the first time that a heavyweight title bout ended by disqualification since the 1941 bout between Joe Lewis and Buddy Bear where Bear's manager refused to leave the ring. The bout was compared to other bizarre boxing events like the Phantom Punch bout between Muhammad Ali and Sonny Liston and the long count fight between Gene Tunney and Jack Dempsey. As soon as he butted me, I watched him. He had me holding and he looked right at me and I saw him and he was going for and he kept going for me and he butted me again. He been butting me for two fights. What am I to do? This is my career. I can't continue getting butted like that. Life. I got children to raise, and we and we complain about the um the first fight. I got to retaliate. Holyfield is not the tough warrior everyone says he is. He got a little nicks on him there, and he quit. I got an eye. I got one eye. He got ears. If he take one, I got another one. I'm ready to fight. He didn't want to fight. I'm ready to fight him right now. I did address it. I addressed it in the ring. Look at me. Look at me. I gotta go home. My kids are gonna be scared of me. Look at me, man. In the first defense in his second reign as WBC champion, Lennox Lewis won via disqualification over undefeated Henry Akinwande. Lewis was in firm control of the bout before it was stopped due to Akinwande's excessive holding. This was also only the second time that two British-born boxers fought for the heavyweight title. As a reminder, Akinwande vacated the WBO title to face Lennox. Yet another big fight now had ended by disqualification in the heavyweight division. Something's gone on here. Three months later, Lennox Lewis engaged Andrew Galata in his second defense of the WBC title. As you can imagine, this was supposed to be the super fight with Riddick Bowe, but we know how that ended. Galata was expected to put up a grand affair against Lewis after his efforts against Bo, but in a shocker, Lewis finished Galata in the first round with two dominant knockdowns and a lopsided display. Galata himself appeared stunned on the mat from how easily he'd been squared away. In the aftermath of the bout, it was revealed that Galata had a lidocaine injection before the bout for knee pain. It may have compromised his performance and he suffered a life-threatening seizure after the bout, of which he'd be resuscitated and make a full recovery. He was fined $5,000 and sued the doctor who administered the shot for $21 million. The case was settled for $1 million. And it's important to note that none of this detracts from Lewis's win. He looked to be in his absolute peak and pinnacle on this night. Now, about that checkup we mentioned earlier. Any remaining questions about Jorge Luis Gonzalez were answered with expedience when Michael Grant eviscerated him in the first round 
Grant made a great statement and Gonzalez would fade away, retiring in 2002. At least he went undefeated for the rest of the 90s, one of those wins coming over Alex Stewart. In a rematch of their 1994 title bout for the exact same titles, minus the lineage, Evander Holyfield and Michael Moore went to war over the WBA titles. The first four rounds were evenly contested and there was concern in the air for Holyfield that it would rhyme with the first bout, especially after the clash of heads that cut Holyfield. Moore took advantage using his jab leading into the fifth where he and observers were shocked when Holyfield decked Moore, sending him to the canvas. Moore answered the count and recovered well enough to have a good sixth round. Again, things looked to be mirroring the first fight as Moore was also dropped in that affair. In the seventh, this fight proved to be very different as Holyfield again stunned Moore twice before dropping him for the second time. He was knocked down again by a Holyfield uppercut in the round, to which he would again answer the count. What heart. In the eighth, Holyfield dropped Moore twice more, and again Moore answered the count, showcasing that he had amazing heart and will of his own. He survived the round, and ringside Dr. Flip Hemansky stopped the bout, despite pleas from Moore to let him continue. Evander Holyfield had just unified the WBA and IBF titles in a remarkable effort against former conqueror Michael Moorer. This was Double M's last fight in the 90s. He would return at the turn of the millennium in 2000. On the undercard, David Tua easily dispatched of Jeff Lally in two rounds to jumpstart his road back after the close loss to Ibea Bucci. In the main event, 48-year-old George Foreman fought an impressive bout in his defense of the lineage against Shannon, let's go champ, the Cannon Briggs. However, the judges didn't see it the same as most onlookers and rewarded Briggs the win. Shannon Briggs was the new lineal heavyweight champion of the world. This wound up being the last bout in the illustrious career of George Foreman. His second career only served to hammer home what everyone had already known deep down. George Foreman was arguably the greatest heavyweight of all time. He competed in the two arguable best eras for heavyweights and been on top of the mountain in both. His success outside of the ring still lingers to this day as George is also one of the greatest salesmen of all time. All well earned to the greatest comeback story in boxing history. A story you can again Catch on the big screen as of right now as George finally has his own movie. From heel to face, from villain to hero, from dark to light, ladies and gentlemen, Big George Foreman. Thank you, sir. At the conclusion of 1997, these were Ring Magazine's top 10 ranked heavyweights. Finally, there was a unified champion in Evander Holyfield after he avenged his loss to Michael Moore to bring the WBA and IBF titles together. Lennox Lewis was rolling as the WBC champion. Shannon Briggs was the new lineal heavyweight champion of the world. Speaking of which, our upset of the year goes to Shannon Briggs and his very questionable win over Big George Foreman for the heavyweight lineage. Had Foreman been awarded the victory, we may have gotten Lennox Lewis and George Foreman. Our round of the year is a tie between the seventh and eighth rounds of Holyfield Moore 2. 
Moore fought back through the storm against a dominant Holyfield before the bout was stopped by the ringside doctor. Amazing effort from both warriors. Our fight of the year goes to the unexpected power punch a thon between David Tu and Ike Ibiabuchi. Both men looked great after the fight and looked to be on their way to making waves in the division. Once again, Ring Magazine awarded Evander Holyfield as Fighter of the Year. The real deal continued to dazzle in his second prime with notable rematch wins over Mike Tyson and Michael Moore. Looks like the man just has your number if your name's Mike. He was the unified WBA IBF champion and boxing fans were looking forward to a potential unification bout with WBC champion Lennox The Lion Lewis. On March 18th, Chris Bird beat Burt Cooper by unanimous decision. On May 16th, Andrew Galata and merciless Ray Mercer were supposed to fight, but Galata had to pull out due to an injury. It was rescheduled for August 16th, but Mercer had to pull out for neck surgery. Unfortunately, the bout never happened. Shannon Briggs and Chris Bird were also scheduled to fight on the night. On September 27th, Olog Maskiev TKO'd Alex Stewart in Moscow. On October 30th, Carl, the truth, Williams had his last bout in New York. Williams was a solid contender who never won the big one. Mike Tyson had banished himself from the title picture and the division as a whole. It would be a while before we saw Iron Mike again in the world of boxing. Lennox Lewis looked incredible having bounced back 100-fold from his loss to McCall three years earlier. The heavyweight picture was boiling down. Overall, 1997 was a shell shocker of a year that finally saw a branch of unification. Evander Holyfield and Lennox Lewis had emerged from the deep waters of the heavyweight division as the two best. Shannon Briggs held the lineage and stood in the way of a potential unification bout between Lewis and Holyfield. Surely, 1998 would bring us closer to true unification. Just who does the mountaintop belong to?